Hello everyone, I'm David Hill, Musical Director of the Bach Choir in London, and we're here to talk about Samuel Coleridge Taylor's Solemn Prelude. And to talk about it, I'd like to welcome our guests, Alexis Patterson, Chief Executive of the Three Choirs Festival, and Michael Fuller, double bass player in the wonderful Philharmonia Orchestra. Welcome. Hello. Uh, so Thanks, let's, not at all. So let's get going with this marvellous piece, actually, which... Um, well, was written in 1899 for the Three Choirs Festival um, and disappeared. Uh, but it was then in 2021 performed again uh, at the uh, festival, which was a wonderful moment. And I was very privileged to conduct that with the Philharmonia Orchestra. So, Alexis, uh, over to you now. Just tell us a little bit of the genesis of how uh, all, all of this worked out. So... Um... So 2021, obviously, was um, it was the year we came out of lockdown. And during 2020, we had a whole process of of redesigning the festival programme. We had to have various different contingencies and we slimmed it down a little bit. Um, but one of the things we knew we wanted to do in the original programme was look back to the 1899 festival. And I was looking at the programmes and... Um, Elgar, who has a very strong connection with the festival, um, had given the version premiere of the Enigma Variations that year. And when I was reading through the um, the annals that we have, which are the records that all of the musical directors kept from year to year, there's also mention of this piece by Samuel Coleridge Taylor, The Solemn Prelude. Um, and I knew already that the previous year, 1898, um, we'd premiered his ballad in A, which is quite well known and it's still still in orchestral repertoire today. Uh, but I'd never come across the Solemn Prelude. I'd never heard of it. And I went away and tried to look it up and I could find a piano score of it, um, but no more information. And I couldn't find any record of it being performed recently and I couldn't find a recording. Um, and possibly slightly naively, I thought, oh, well, that's definitely something we should do then. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, and then realised that it it really didn't exist in terms of orchestral materials. So um, then I had to find it. I did a lot of Googling. Um, I thought that maybe it was out there somewhere under an obscure publisher. We knew that we knew that Novello had originally published the piano reduction, but um, a lot of Novello's orchestral materials have been lost over the years for various reasons. Um, and I went to the British Library archive catalogues because that's always where you start for these kind of things. Um, it was still locked down, so I had to, you know, book a very particular slot at the British Library and got a very particular time. And um, I think the first the first appointment I had had to be cancelled because there was a new lockdown. So by the time I eventually got to the British Library, it was. It was quite late in the day to be still trying to find a piece that we'd said we'd perform. Um, but luckily it was it was a full manuscript and it was wonderful opening up that box. It was, you know, a box of his manuscripts um, with Solemn Prelude in. And it, it was clear the moment I opened it that not only was it the, the full manuscript, but it was probably also the one he conducted from. It was all marked up with those kind of extra bits of red pencil that give a conductor their, their sort of extra cues. And what was also fascinating is that the pages were all numbered, but they were non-consecutive. So I think at some point he'd obviously had second thoughts about the form Um maybe cut he obviously cut pages and stuck them back together and put them in a different order and there's also there's a lot of pencil markings so some of the doubling between the winds and the strings is is added in in pencil and it's impossible to know now of course whether that was put in in the course of rehearsal or whether it was done after the event with the intention that it would be revised for future performance we will never know i suppose but the version that you are performing does include all of those doublings the editorial decision was that the pencil markings would be included fascinating and do we know that in fact elgar was the person who commissioned this from as it were from coleridge teller on behalf of the three choirs festival do you think he would have been present at that performance definitely present at the performance i think undoubtedly so elgar went to pretty much all of the Worcester festivals, as as did lots of other composers. Vaughan Williams was always there, Holst was often there, Howells was often there. Um, but actually, 
although Elgar recommended Coleridge Taylor to the festival, but it would actually have been Brewer, I think. Yes, Heard was the Brewer. Brewer. He was then, of course, the organist of yeah. the cathedral, wasn't he? Uh, so, Michael, um, uh, what is? do you have a recollection of us doing this? And what is your feeling about the actual piece? Yeah, yeah, I remember it really clearly, actually. And, you know, it's actually, it's great to get this backstory. I mean, it's amazing. And I didn't really know any of that. I'd heard a little bit of, you know, just a little bit of chatter about that it was, you know, it was a piece that had been lost and rediscovered. But, you know, as an orchestral player, you've always got such a huge volume of repertoire to go through. And it, really your focus is sort of, you know, on, of course, preparing and getting ready and, and performing the pieces, you know, the next piece that's in front of you. But in terms of performing the piece, it was, I mean, of course, that was a very memorable year because it was the first year that we came back, that we came back to the Three Choirs Festival after having it been canceled. It was almost like the first week, I think, where basically all sort of restrictions, you know, distancing restrictions had been removed. And so that was, um, it was an interesting moment. And and to be honest, there was, you know, there was this kind of feeling of, of risk in a way. All of that was such a huge reminder that, you know, that nothing is guaranteed, right? That there's no... You know, there's no performance that is, we take it for granted all the time that something is scheduled and it's going to happen. It definitely served to make all of these performances more, I guess, more precious in a way, because when it actually happened, you realize how much it took to to make it happen. Uh, and then the piece itself, I mean, I just remember, and also I've been, I've been listening to it a couple of times uh, in advance of this interview. And it's really, I mean, it, it's such a gorgeous piece. And what what really strikes me is that there is solemnity about it, but there's also so much else that's going on. There's all these, there's a real kind of urgency in the phrasing and in the writing. And there's, a, there, I find there's almost kind of a tempestuous quality, something that maybe you wouldn't necessarily automatically associate with solemnity. And I just find that it makes it much more rich as an experience in terms of how we listen to the piece and, and sort of what's there. It's quite interesting, isn't it, that... Um... He chose to write solemn prelude in three four um to mm -hmm. produce this kind of sense of solemnity, which often composers would have used you know would have used four four or in, or something of that mm. you know, slightly more sort of stable yeah uh, one two three four rather than three four is associated with often lightness isn't it in in music um and but you know here's the thing um the enigma variations um uh which were you know around uh what's the most so solemn moment in those it's mm -hmm. Nim nimrod and it's three four and i think it's also this is uh, for me it was also samuel Coleridge taylor saying doffing his cap if you like to to elgar and saying you know uh, thank you for this opportunity possibly but also this is a year only a year after his massive success of a work which became you know uh, household in terms of fame Hiawatha's wedding feast which was you know conducted by Stanford uh and uh Stanford by the way was a I have to put this in was a for many years a musical director of the Bach choir in London and so there were there led these lovely sort of connections here and also that uh Coleridge Taylor himself was born in 1875 well the Bach choir was was uh created in 1876 so I love these uh, little kind of uh, connections here um uh, and just i mean just in a few words just a few words what does the work actually mean to you alexis michael described it beautifully is it's that it, there's a kind of there's a sort of really restrained turbulence in it mm. that it's sort of it you feel like it sort of just wants to to let go but it, it always holds it's sort of held back somehow. So you do have that real tension in it all the time. But it's I mean, it's got some beautiful tunes. It's it's very romantic. Surely that's the that's the reason we want everyone to come and hear it because Yeah. It's, and it's I mean look, I I I think there's there's something about a live performance, right? That it you always hear things differently when they're live. You notice things that you don't hear on a recording. And I think as well, this the fact that it's a lost piece and actually a lot of his work is is lost. I think when you when you hear music for the first time, the music that surrounds it, you hear differently as well. So it, it's listening to live music is always a process of reinvention, and and that's mm. that's why you should go and hear something something from an era that you think you know well that you might not yet have heard yet. Michael, can you describe in a few words what the solemn prelude means to you? Well, 
I suppose the most obvious word would be solemn, but <laughs> but actually, I think the piece is there's almost more to it than that. Uh, I think underneath that solemnity, there is a, a kind of tempestuousness. Mm -hmm. There's a uh, there's a yearning. There's a there's a real dynamic quality that is something that maybe we wouldn't necessarily automatically associate with with solemnity. And I think that's what makes the piece really fascinating and special. David, obviously, you conducted the first time round, but was yeah. was that memory on your mind when you thought this is this is what I've got to add to the Bart Choir program? He, that, that's a good question, Alex. Thank you. Um, well, I have I have done it before. I've done it in America too, actually, and uh, the players absolutely adored it. It's very English. Uh, it's got Elgar in it, if you like, but it's like Elgar, it's with a massive German accent. Uh, <laughs> so you've got this sort of Brahms warm feeling of 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 naturalness actually about the way the music evolves and the beautiful the melodies you referred to and particularly the second theme which is just i mean rolling around my mind now um and i think that i thought well firstly it's a perfect length in terms of starting a concert if you want a sort of six seven eight minute piece you know like an overture but that was something that's got real gravitas i thought this would be the piece and then actually we're following it with a a, a work that i'm not sure has even been performed in london by um, amy beach which is the canticle of the sun a fantastic piece of music and there's another forgotten composer who's now re-emerging so yeah there was that because you you can't do too much before the then great Brahms requiem which is the second half this is going to be i think people walk away hopefully saying gosh that is equally as memorable um, because I think it's the quality of any of the great composers. So Alexis, what are you planning for the Free Choirs Festival coming up? So you mentioned Stanford. Um, actually, next year is a big Stanford anniversary. So we're celebrating that and also um, Holst. So there's a lot of Holst and Stanford in next year's programme. And and also in the spirit of those Elgar years, lots of new work. We've got a commission from Nathan James Dearden and um, we're, we've got quite a lot of Judith Weir's music throughout the week and um, uh, a UK premiere of a work by Sarah Kirkland Snyder. Uh, so lot, lots of very, very program. Um, our evening program is available on the website at the moment and our daytime program will be announced in the new year. Um, Where is the festival next year? Just it's Worcester. Me. It's another Worcester year next year. So, um, Michael, um, busy, obviously, with the Philharmonia. What's coming up next? Yeah, there's there's all sorts of stuff uh, going on. We've got a we've got a big American series coming up that's starting, uh, I think, later this month, but certainly well into November. Uh, and then, of course, we're going to be uh, performing Bach Choir in early November on the 2nd. Uh, and then later in May, we have the big Elgar uh, Dream of Gerontius with the Bach Choir. And that's, uh, I mean, I think that of all his sort of oratorio type pieces, if that's the right word to use, he, uh, I mean, Dream of Gerontius is one that is really, really rated very highly by the players. And, and we always feel that that is, is one of the iconic pieces. And of course, remember doing that at the Three Choirs Festival, I think, 2017, maybe, off the top of my head. Thank you for mentioning that. Actually, just also to say that um, the exciting thing is that uh, um, we're preceding uh, Grantius with something short, the uh, Roderick Williams, who's going to be uh, um, uh, giving us something uh, very special, I think. So just to, to finish by saying thank you so much to both thank of you. you for this uh, chat and to everyone else. As Michael has just said, uh, we're meeting uh, with the Philharmonia November the 2nd at the Royal Festival Hall, the programme to be the solemn prelude by Samuel Coleridge-Taylor, followed by Amy Beach's Canticle of the Sun, and then Brahms' great German Requiem. So do come along. See you then. Thank you so much.